Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're gonna do a deep dive into the parasites within your genome, including their diversity and their evolution. Now, if you've seen a few videos in this channel, you know that I'm a big fan of parasites. I find them really cool and bizarre. Um, so let's first start off with just defining parasitism. So importantly, parasitism is a harmful relationship between the host and the parasite. The parasite is actively harming its host, um, and the parasite lives either on the host, such as an ectoparasite, this includes things like lice and fleas, or within the host, um, or an endoparasite, such as uh, flukes, tapeworms, etc. Um, the parasites are typically smaller than the host, and they rely on the host for nutrition and sometimes reproduction. So I've included here three of my favorite parasites. Um, on the left, you can see a dissection that's exposing the tongue-eating isopod. Uh, these are really gnarly little critters. I've actually had the pleasure of prying one out of the mouth of a menhaden, um, and it proceeded to latch onto my finger, and I really had to put some muscle in to pry that thing off. They're incredibly strong critters. Uh, the next one over is the nematode worm, commonly called the heartworm. They infect dogs mostly. Um, and this is actually an image of a dog heart that is just riddled with these heartworms. Uh, and the next to that is Schistosoma masoni. This is the causal agent of schistosomiasis, which is a blood disease um, that's caught, and that's why its common name is the blood fluke. Um, interestingly, most trematodes, which the blood fluke is, are hermaphroditic, but the blood flukes are actually um, dioecious, that is to say they have separate sexes, but the female actually nestles within the male's copulatory groove and just lives there for her entire life. So importantly, there are both living and non-living parasites. Living parasites are like the ones I was just talking about. They also include things like bacteria, like Staphylococcus here, which is the causal agent of staph infections. Um, whereas non-living parasites don't have the same features. They don't have cell membranes. They can't reproduce on their own. Um, they're completely reliant upon the host for basic metabolism, et cetera. Um, and these are things like viruses, right? Um, all forms of viruses are generally considered to be non-living. Now, your genomic parasites, the topic of today's video, are like viruses. They're non-living. Um, and they include things like LTR and non-LTR retrotransposons, um, which transpose using a copy and paste mechanism. We'll talk about what that means in a bit more detail. These include things like the long interspersed nuclear elements or lines, short interspersed nuclear elements or signs, uh, retroviruses, and group two introns. Uh, there are also DNA transposons that don't rely on an RNA intermediate, um, and they transpose using a cut and paste mechanism. Now, importantly, like I said, these are non-living uh, parasites, but they do behave much like parasites. Now, these things were discovered uh, by Barbara McClintock, which wa who was a uh, corn geneticist, um, and she found that these traits were able to jump between chromosomes. She was the first to document this. Um, and she also recorded that mobile elements could impact gene expression, um, and in particular, the gene expression of whatever gene that they were able to get inserted into. Uh, interestingly, she was also the first to propose epigenetics, which is heritable changes in gene expression that's not caused by DNA. So I'm calling these things parasites. So why are they parasites? What makes them like a parasite? Well, importantly, uh, is their genetic architecture. So many transposons code for proteins that allow reverse transcription. Reverse transcription is going from an mRNA transcript back into DNA. Most of the time, it's you're going from DNA to RNA to proteins. They actually take from the DNA, they transcribe it into mRNA, and then that, that RNA transcript gets reinserted back into the genome via some reverse transcriptase mechanism. This is exactly what viruses do. This is how viruses replicate. Um, the LTR retrotransposons code for capsid proteins. Uh, that's this image here, the gag uh, the gag gene in LTR retrotransposons codes for this. Um, so whenever the mRNA leaves the cell, it gets encapsulated in this in this gag protein complex that protects it while it's in the cytoplasm. Again, this is a very virus-like thing. Um, they multiply by hijacking the cell's machinery. 
Um, so again, just like viruses, they will utilize all of the, the mechanisms already in place, the RNA polymerases, the ribosomes, uh, et cetera, to be able to get themselves replicated, get their proteins coded for so that they can get reinserted into the genome. Um, and as I've already been saying, LTR retrotransposons have basically all the same machinery as a retrovirus. The only thing that they're lacking is the ENV gene or the envelope gene. Uh, the envelope gene is what allows viruses to actually build that capsid that allows them to enter into the atmosphere and go vertically between hosts instead of relying on staying within a host cell. Um, also, they're like parasites and that they cause disease. Um, there, there's a ton of known diseases that are caused by transposons. Here are just a few examples. Hemophilia is caused by um, a line insertion. Um, severe combined immunodeficiency is caused by a line insertion. Various liver disorders are caused by alu element insertions. And muscular dystrophy is caused by a transposon insertion. Uh, furthermore, um, we see high levels of gene expression of transposons in cancerous cells relative to normal cells. Um, so we know whenever we get high levels of their expression or when they're actually undergoing transpos transposition, um, more likely than not, they're causing harm. They're doing something damaging, right? So again, just like with viruses, the activity that they undergo, their mobilization, their transposition are harmful to the host. So let's get into the different classes and let's talk about their mechanisms. So first, the class one are the LTR retrotransposons and the non-LTR retrotransposons. LTR retrotransposons, as their name implies, contain long terminal repeats. That's what the LTRs are, um, and they are represented by the arrows here that sit on either side of the gene or either side of the transposon. The transposons have a series of genes. They have the GAG, the protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase. Um, and again, they rely on the cell's ribosomes to actually transcribe these. Um, the gag-like proteins, as I mentioned before, actually form the viral capsule after the mRNA is transcribed. So they undergo transcription here, forming the transposon's mRNA. As it leaves the cytoplasm, the gag surrounds it in this kind of protective capsule. Uh, and then they generate reverse transcriptase, which is the protein that's going to grab it and actually convert it into double-stranded DNA. Um, and then integrase binds to either side and carries it back into the nucleus and inserts it into the genome. It does this by causing the staggered NIC, uh, actually cutting open the host genome and inserting itself. Uh, interestingly, what these cuts do is they cause a target site duplication, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. So if this is our target site here, the way it cuts is staggered on either side, and then it slices it right across the middle. And then it just slides them open. The transposon is inserted. So these are the long terminal repeats on either end of the transposon. And then these are the host DNA. Now what happens is the repair mechanisms in the host DNA just fix the missing ends. So they fill, they fill in the missing DNA on the leading and lagging strands. And what that ends up leading to is a target site duplication. So now you've gone from that single target site at the top to it being exactly duplicated on either side of the inserted transposon. And this is a telltale sign that transposons have, that this transposon has been inserted into this location. Um, so I've been talking a lot about LTR retrotransposons and comparing them to retroviruses, and, and I showed a phylogeny previously that actually demonstrates that retroviruses are a class of LTR retrotransposons. So that leads to the question of their origin, which came first, retroviruses or retrotransposons? Um, the main difference, as I said, between these two is the presence of the envelope gene in retroviruses. The LTR retrotransposons don't have these. So you can ask, did an exogenous retrovirus integrate into a host genome and subsequently lose that envelope gene, giving rise to retrotransposons? Or did an already existing LTR retrotransposon acquire an envelope gene and that allowed it to escape the host genome? Um, so this creates a kind of chicken and an egg uh, situation here where it could be either direction. Now, you might think you could answer this phylogenetically by saying, OK, do the retrotranspo or do the retroviruses cluster within a broader family of retrotransposons? 
And if so, then that would seem to indicate that they arose from within retrotransposons. Now, that does seem to be the case, and most of the phylogenies I've seen, they appear to cluster within. But there's an important caveat here, and that's that these sequences evolve very, very rapidly. Um, and so when you have very rapid sequence evolution, it's hard to find good homology uh, whenever you're doing your alignments to build your phylogenetic tree. Um, so the nodes in those trees tend to have pretty low support. Uh, so you're not super confident in the exact branching pattern. You just know that they that they're all related that they're highly related to one another relative to other transposons. Um, so this is a pro this is still an active area of research. Um, people are still proposing different models uh, in both directions. Okay, so continuing in class one are the non-LTR retrotransposons. So unlike the previous, these do not have long terminal repeats. Um, instead, they have just the five prime and the three prime UTR. Um, and instead of having the, the, the GAG, the integrase, the reverse transcriptase, et cetera, genes, they only have two genes, uh, ORF1 and ORF2. They just stand for open reading frame. Um, and instead of, like, so they don't form the gag, the RNA is still transcribed and still leaves the nucleus, but um, when it gets shuttled back in, it is not double-stranded. It doesn't have uh, reverse transcriptase to get it to be double-stranded. Um, so following its transcription, the target site that it's going to get inserted into gets nicked by endonuclease, and this primes it for reverse transcription, and this allows it to be inserted. Now, the way in which this happens is this nick forms this this dangling strand that it's just going to get fed into. This often causes, however, a five a five prime in truncation, um, and so the new insertion doesn't is not actually the full length of the original retrotransposon. Um, and you can see that happening in this figure here. You can see the um, RNA is getting transcribed back in, and then that's leading to this not complete um, transposon. The full sequence is not being transposed. Uh, what this means is that very often when non-LTR retrotransposons actually mobilize and transpose, they're dead on arrival. Uh, when they arrive, they are no longer capable of mobilizing again because they are, they're degraded, right? By literally just the process of, of transposition is so error prone that they're, that they're highly degraded. Um, interestingly, endonucleases and reverse transcriptase that are coded by these non-LTR retrotransposons are often used by other non-autonomous transposons opportunistically. Um, so when they generate, you know, the, the various proteins that they do, other transposons that don't generate those can actually use them um, and become autonomous despite not being able to code for their own. Um, now, non-LTR retrotransposons include things like lines, which are the, the human L1 example, and signs include alu elements. Um, alu elements are in incredibly prevalent across the human genome. There's a ton of them. In fact, there's over a million copies of alu elements in the human genome. They're widespread across primates as well. This is a karyotype that has been stained to show you um, the alu elements. All the things that you see in green here are alu elements in the chromosomes. Uh, the red is just like a background staining that you can compare against. Um, so as you can see, there are several chromosomes that are majority alu elements, right? They are, they are very widespread genomic parasites in humans. Okay, so class two is the DNA transposons. Unlike the previous ones where they copy and pasted themselves uh, into a new location, these undergo a cut and paste mechanism. So instead of making a copy and that copy then inserting, now they go from double-stranded DNA, they get cut out using transposase, and then that that sequence is removed from the host DNA and then gets transposed into a different location, right? Um, they are flanked by these internal, or excuse me, inverted terminal repeats, um, and they code for protein transposase, as I was just talking about. Um, they often also make these staggered cuts that are between four to eight base pairs in length that also generates these uh, double strand or these target site duplications. So you, you might be asking, how can they increase their copy number if they're just being cut and reinserted? Does it, they're just moving around. How do they actually proliferate? If they're really a parasite, they need to be proliferating. Well, 
Interestingly, they increase their copy number via transposing during DNA synthesis. So when the DNA is being split and, and it's being sent, the leading and lagging strands are being synthesized, then it will transpose so that when it gets inserted, it actually gets doubled. Currently, these are pretty low, uh, a pretty low fraction of the human genome, only about 2% of the human genome contains DNA transposon. Okay, so how much of your genome is composed of parasites? So about 45% of your genome is made up of defective transposons and their fragments. Um, only 0.1% of your genome is made up of actual functional transposons, those that are capable of mobilizing and transpositioning. Um, another 9% is composed of defective viral sequences um, and their fragments. So we call these endogenous retroviruses or ERVs or sometimes just ERVs. Um, and these are retroviruses that have sequence homology to other to actual exogenous retroviruses, but they're degraded, right? So they're either missing a gene or they have a, a frame shift mutation that's caused a stop codon prematurely, et cetera. They no longer have an open reading frame, et cetera. However, 0.1% of your genome is composed of viral sequences that are active, that are still capable of, of transposing and mobilizing. Um, so if we just add up those numbers, that gives us already 54.2% of your genome is composed of genomic parasites. Now, this number is conservative because we're not considering all of the retro elements that exist in introns, that exist in pseudogenes, etc. So there's lots of other parts of your genome that also has retro element insertions that we're just not counting in this because it gets messy and we have to like separate introns out by different classes and it becomes a whole thing. Um, but already just from the unambiguous ones, over half of your genome is composed of parasites. Now, what's really interesting is that there is a clear relationship between the size of your genome and the number of transposable elements that you harbor. So you may not know this, but human genome size is variable between individuals. In fact, there's about 6% variation on average between any two individuals. That's 165 million base pair differences on average between me and you. That's a lot of differences, right? And the proportion of parasitic DNA that differs between us strongly predicts the difference in genome size. So this is a study by Sun et al, on the x-axis is the proportion of, um, of repetitive content. On the y-axis is genome size. So you can see on all of these that are plotted, there is a clear positive correlation. As you get more and more repetitive elements, your genome size is going up. So it's explaining this increase in genome size. Um, included in these are things like centromeric repeats in A, um, ERV sequences B, this is that positive relationship. The more ERVs you have, the bigger your genome is, obviously. Line elements, ALU elements, um, et cetera. All of these things are positively correlating with genome size. Um, and we can see these not just in humans, but across the tree of life. As genome sizes get bigger, more and more of their genome is becoming occupied not by functional things like coding elements, but rather by mobile elements and intergenic elements. Okay, so now you might be asking, how do we know they aren't functional for the host? They are functional, uh, the ones that are capable of mobilizing, importantly, but they're functional for the parasite, not for the genome in which they live, right? So, so when we say, how do we know they aren't functional? We mean, how do we know they aren't functional for the host? There are several important lines of evidence for this. First, their patterns of insertion are highly variable and are often polymorphic within populations. So there's lots of variation at the, at the, at the coding, at the sequence level, um, but where they are inserted varies across populations. And I, I showed you previously the correlation between genome size and repetitive content clearly shows this. Now, what's not variable are things like protein coding genes, right? If you are completely missing a protein coding gene, you're in trouble, right? Non-coding RNA genes, these are, are critical. If you're missing these, you're in trouble. So like this kind of levels of variation is how we know that something is not actually contributing uh, to function.
Second is that their mutation rate matches the background rate of mutation. That is to say they have much higher rates of mutation than functional regions of the genome, such as protein coding regions. Um, when you just take the background, how, how fast does mutation occur, the, the amount of sequence diversity in transposons matches that sequence diversity. Selection, however, for fu on functional regions, depresses the amount of diversity because as mutations happen, they tend to be deleterious when they happen in functional regions. But when they happen in non-functional regions, they're not deleterious because it's not affecting the fitness of the host. Therefore, selection doesn't depress diversity and you get high levels of diversity that match the mutation rate. That's how that argument works. Third, new insertions. So brand new insertions are often highly deleterious. Right. So whenever they are capable of mobilizing and reinserting, they're bad. They, they don't do anything you want them to do. Now, you might be asking, how is that evidence that they aren't functional? Well, remember, this is all they do. Right? This is what transposable elements do. It's in their name. They are only capable that all of their genes are for getting themselves transcribed, protecting them while they're being uh, while they're being converted to double-stranded RNA, and then getting themselves in, reinserted in a different place in the host genome. That's it. That's all that they do, okay? So if that action of being lifted up and placed someplace else is deleterious, then they, by their by their very nature, can't be benefiting the host, right? Because that's all they do. That That is their, that's their whole shtick. Uh, fourth, the, ho the host genome employs a bunch of molecular techniques to prevent them from doing this, right? This is a, a, like the, we are fighting them. Our genomes are actively fighting these, these transposons. Um, we do this by employing what are called RNA intermediates, such as the, the peewee RNA complex, protein complex. Um, what this does is it can actually identify uh, mRNA, like highly repetitive mRNA. It can identify it and it degrades it. Right, it recognizes it as one of these parasitic sequences, and it and it kills it. Um, it also acts as silencing them, so it will bind to their promoter regions, to the promoter regions of these transposons, and shut them off. Right, so that they effectively don't keep getting themselves transcribed, which allows them to get themselves inserted somewhere. So the fact that we have a ton of mechanisms actively fighting against these things is a testament that they aren't functional for the host, and that they're actually parasitic. Um, and then finally, most of them are fragmented, highly degraded, and aren't even capable of mobilization anymore anyway. Um, so the only thing that they're really good at, mobilizing, most of them can't even do that. Um, so again, that, that fact alone also helps demonstrate that they aren't functional. They're, they are parasites, and if they've been in the genome for long enough, they've undergone so much mutational, uh, so much mutation that they've just degraded away. Um, okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the population genetics of transposable elements. So first, um, the population genetic conditions for the establishment of transposons. So for a transposon to establish, the rate of insertion must exceed both the selective cost and the rate of excision. Okay, so selection, is, right, is the how costly is it to have this insertion event? And then the rate of excision is just the physical mechanisms of of deletion. It's a mutational process of deleting the sequence itself, which occurs at some given, at some rate, right? Um, and so for this to occur, this R value that I'm showing here, this is the, the you can think of it as like the net replacement rate. Um, this value has to be one or greater, right? If it's one or greater, um, then you have you can have a, a persistence and proliferation, right? You can have mobilization and prol proliferation. If it's less than one, then eventually it will just disappear from the population. It's not getting enough replacement to overcome selection, removing it, and excision, removing it, okay? Um, now, rates of insertion and excision have been estimated, for example, in Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, um, and the insertion rates are 1e to the negative 4, and the excision rates are 1e to the negative 6, right? So um, under this rate, assuming that selection is not too strong, you can get insertion and proliferation of transposable elements. Um, we can dig into this math a little bit further. So for a finite population with proportion uh, P of N that are selectively neutral insertions, uh, R then is approximately equal to the mutation rate 
multiplied by the proportion of uh, effectively neutral, selectively neutral alleles or selectively neutral insertions divided by the rate that they get excised um, plus the rate at which selection removes them is that is the second term. That's this term here. Um, now, if so long as S is much greater than the rate of excision and the rate of insertion, which tends to be the case, um, most uh, empirical data tends to suggest that that's true, then we can actually ignore this second term because selection is going to be effectively always removing anything that's not effectively neutral, right? That's, that's what that term represents. Uh, then this equation simplifies down to simply the mutation rate times the proportion that are selectively neutral over the excision rate. So ultimately, what all of that tells us is that for it to establish, for the proportion of effectively neutral um, transposons to become established and be inserted, the insertion rate, all it needs to do is exceed the rate of excision, right? Okay, so now you might be asking if transposons are parasites, if they're deleterious, why doesn't selection just get rid of them, right? Why doesn't it just weed them out? Now, we touched on this a little bit in the, the previous slide, um, but we can get a little bit more into the pop gen here. So the probability of fixation, considering selection and population size, is shown by this expression here. Um, so this is the probability of fixation is equal to two times the selection coefficient times the effective population size divided by the census population size. All of that divided by one e to the negative four times the effective size times the selection coefficient. Now I've plotted this um, here. So this is the probability of fixation on the Y and then the selection coefficient on the X. At zero at the dotted line here, these are selectively neutral. Um, they are, this is, they're actually truly neutral because S is zero here. Um, and each one of these, these colored lines represents different effective population sizes. So when the population is small at 500, you can see for even um, relatively deleterious alleles, the probability of fixation is greater than zero, right? Um, however, when you get a, a fairly large population size, the probability of fixation becomes zero pretty quickly for deleterious mutations, right? Um, so what this shows us is, this, is that there's a relationship between how strong selection is and the size of the population, right? That the population size for the exact same selection coefficient can, uh, can allow for these transposons to persist and proliferate, despite the fact that they may be uh, negative. Um, um, thus, we can make a prediction here. Based on the pop gen we've just, just chatted about, organisms that have larger population sizes, therefore, should be more efficient at resisting transposable element accumulation, assuming transposable elements are effectively neutral, that they are mildly deleterious, um, they, they should be more efficient at getting rid of them, right? So we should see some scaling pattern between genome size, population size, and transposable element accumulation. And amazingly, we do. So this, these are a couple of studies by Michael Lynch. Um, over here on the left, this is the effective population size times the mutation rate. You can think this is called the, um, the population mutation rate is what this is commonly called. Um, but you can see the ones with the greatest values. These are, our, um, these are all prokaryotes. You get slightly smaller values at, eukary or at unicellular eukaryotes. Smaller values still at the inverts, even smaller at vascular plants and vertebrates, right? So the population size is, you know, is going down as you get to bigger and, and bigger organisms effectively. Now, down here on the B panel, we can see this stri very strong negative correlation between genome size and the population size, right? So genomes get bigger, populations are getting smaller. Right. This is exactly as we predicted. And furthermore, this increase in genome size, as I showed you previously, is due to the accumulation of mobile elements, which are able to proliferate because the population size is small, meaning more of those transposable elements are behaving under effective neutrality. Right. So as predicted, we see a strong negative relationship between genome size and population size. And furthermore, as the genome size increases, the proportion of parasitic DNA increases.
Okay, now let's talk a little bit more about the evolutionary dynamics of host-parasite interactions. And in particular, we're going to talk about the molecular arms race that exists between parasitic DNA and their hosts. So initially what happens is the parasitic DNA gets inserted into the host genome and it's going to start replicating. Now the host has to find a way to respond to this or it's going to get overwhelmed and you're going to get a lot of degradation of gene function. So initially the host finds a way to contain that retro element. Right. But over time, mutational processes continue on that transposon, which eventually a lot might allow it to find a way to escape the original containment scheme. And so then it begins to proliferate again. And now the host must rapidly evolve to once again try to contain it. So that's the molecular arms race that can exist. And what I would like to do is give you a very specific example of this from a really cool study on Drosophila. Um, so Drosa this is the phylogenetic tree of different species of Drosophila. Um, interestingly, they have retro elements inserted into their telomeres. Um, and telomeres exist at the ends of linear chromosomes. They are typically highly repetitive, um, and their function um, is to prevent chromosome shortening during replication. This is a problem that's unique to eukaryotes because we have linear chromosomes instead of circular chromosomes like prokaryotes. Now, many protein complexes interact with telomeres. They do this for various different reasons, but mostly because they're they're forming like end protection, right, to prevent uh, end-to-end -end fusions between linear chromosomes. Um, and so, just like in other species, Drosophila have these protein complexes binding to the ends of their telomeres. But interestingly, their complexes show really high DNDS ratios. Now, what that stands for is the ratio of the rate of non-synonymous over synonymous substitutions. Non-synonymous substitutions are ones that change the amino acid. Right. And so generally are thought to change the protein structure, whereas synonymous changes don't change the amino acid that's being coded for. So when you get really high rates of um, non-synonymous changes relative to synonymous, that tends to indicate positive selection. That selection is driving this protein to rapidly change in response to some kind of evolutionary pressure, right? So given that these protein complexes all do the same thing across these different species, that is to say it protects telomeres, um, prevents into infusions, et cetera, provides some like instability, why is it that they appear to be rapidly evolving under positive selection? Um, so the one of the particular um, subunits of the terminating complex, the terminating complex is what sits on that end, is called hope. Um, and what this subunit does is it provides in protection. Uh, like I said, it prevents into infusions, and it it restricts that retro element from expanding. It, it keeps the telomere size stable. Right. Um, and so those two are very important jobs. You don't want your telomere ends just growing really, really large um, and you don't want to end to infusion. So hope needs to be able to carry out that function. Now, what this study did is it looked into is it tried to figure out why is it that positive selection appears to be driving the evolution of these proteins when they really should be conserved? They should be staying the same to continue to maintain the function that they do. Right. So using CRISPR-Cas9, what these researchers did is they actually took the HOPE subunit from a relative of Drosophila melanogaster, which is Drosophila yacuba, and they swapped them. They placed the, the yacuba uh, HOPE subunit into melanogaster. And what they wanted to see is if it was still able to maintain the same function. Now, first, they found, indeed, that it was able to prevent into infusions. It bound to the telomeres, just like in melanogaster. So it was able to, to do the job that it would normally do. But what it wasn't able to do is contain the Drosophila melanogaster retrotransposon. So shown here on this bottom, this is the... Um, the amount of euchromatin insertion of the of the retro element. So this is where the retro element is being inserted elsewhere. Um, and you can see when the protein is the normal control, when it's actually the melanogaster version, you have very low levels of insertion elsewhere in the genome. But when you've 
but when you swapped it with a subunit from Yakuba, you suddenly get very high insertion patterns, indicating that while it's performing the end-to-end -end fusion prevention, the that particular function it's it's performing, it can't seem to contain the retro element, which is now rapidly proliferating. Now, importantly, Yakuba also has a retro element, right? Like all Drosophila have retro elements as their telomeres. Um, and so the fact that it's been so rapidly – that these elements are so rapidly evolving indicates that in each one of these unique lineages, the subunits that are containing the size of that retro element are having to rapidly evolve in response to the retro element constantly trying to escape. Um, and this is a, a testament to the molecular arms race between the retro element trying to expand, trying to mobilize, and the proteins of the host that are trying to prevent it from doing so. Okay, now let's talk about phylogenetics and retro element insertion patterns. So retro elements, we've been talking about them as parasites and kind of painting them in a bad light, but they are really, really useful for phylogenetics. And the reason for this is because they have very low rates of homoplasy. Um, and what homoplasy is, is it's, it's like convergence in two distinct lineages where you have, let's say, two nucleotide base positions are exactly the same because they've mutated to the same position, not because they share a common ancestor, right? Now, given that there's only four nucleotide bases to mutate to, this can happen at a, at a fairly high rate under just DNA sequences. But what makes retro elements useful is the probability of insertion in any one location in the genome, given the, the size of the genome, is incredibly low, right? So like if you have two different species that have the exact same insertion in the exact same location, that's very strong evidence that that insertion happened in their common ancestor and not independently in each of those lineages. So what a lot of studies have done, and this is an example from Gatesy and Springer where they are building the avian phylogeny, is they actually reconstruct the tree based on the insertion patterns of retro elements. Um, and it's been able to resolve some really, really difficult nodes in the, in the bird phylogeny that were not able to be resolved using just DNA sequence data alone. Another important thing that they can – that transposons can serve in phylogenetics is as molecular clocks. So as I stated previously, the mutation rate in transposable elements matches the background rate, right? And so that means that they should diverge kind of linearly with time, right? You shouldn't see very, you know, like big jumps in, in their rate of divergence because it should behave relatively clock-like. Um, now, what um, this particular study that I'm showing here did is they looked at endogenous retroviruses in rodents to see if they could find a relatively constant scaling pattern in divergence across rodent species. Um, and, and they found both in LTR regions, which is the A panel, um, as well as in the envelope genes, very, very linear, clear, constant scaling. So you can see here, this is for transitions. You can see there's a missing spot because they don't have any that are diverged along that line. But you can imagine drawing a line straight through and it would hit the ones above, right? So the, the scaling is still roughly one to one. Um, you can see a little bit of falling off with the transversions, but transversions happen less than transitions. And the same thing is true for the ENV protein. You can see it's a roughly linear uh, scaling and a roughly linear scaling, though uh, with a lower slope for the um, transversions. They also carried out a maximum likelihood examination to see if they could reject a molecular clock hypothesis. Um, they did this for both the LTR as well as for the ENV gene, and as you can see here, they found no statistical significance to reject a constant scaling pattern. Um, again, indicating that these transposons are behaving really well as molecular clocks. Um, another really cool way in which they've been used as molecular clocks is by actually dating the divergence between paired in LTRs. So remember, as I said before, all LTR retrotransposons have long terminal repeats on either end of the transposon. Now, when they are initially inserted, those LTRs are identical to each other. They're exactly the same. And so as after they've been inserted, though, and as time passes, they independently acquire mutations 
from each other. So what you can do is actually align the two LTR sequences and count up the number of differences between them. Given that you know the mutation rate, you can get an absolute measure of time since the insertion of that transposon. Um, tons of studies have done this exact thing. And then here's, I'm just showing you an example um, where they were able to calculate roughly times of insertion uh, using this kind of LTR uh, divergence as a molecular clock. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about is when parasites become symbionts. Um, so humans have been really good at domesticating things, right? We've domesticated lots of things, whether they're dogs or cows or horses or et cetera, plants, tons of plants we've domesticated. Um, evolution is pretty good about leading organisms towards domestication with one another. Um, and this is not just the, the case of humans actively doing something, but genomic elements can also be domesticated, right? Um, and so that means that sometimes these transposons that are by their nature deleterious can be co-opted and domesticated by the host genome. So I wanna give you a couple of examples of when this has happened. Um, so one is that transposons have the capacity to impact gene regulation, and therefore they can get co-opted by regulatory networks. So remember, transposons have their own promoters, right? So because they want to get themselves uh, trans uh, transcribed and translated. Now, importantly, though, many of them become degraded. So if most of the transposon gets degraded, but the promoter is still there, and somewhere upstream you have a de novo gene, an incipient gene, something that's um, that's beginning to form some function but needs a promoter, it can utilize the promoter that may still exist from this defective transposon to get itself transcribed, right? So in this way, and in many other ways, these transposons can provide their promoters as a way of interacting with regulatory networks. Second, a pretty neat example is that placental development in primates relies on syncytin-1, which is derived from an endogenous retrovirus. Um, importantly, this is actually secondarily derived um, in mice from syncytin A from a different retro element. So placental mammals have done this in different ways, um, but effectively what it does is the syncytin forms this, um, forms this capsule uh, around the, the placenta that prevents the uh, host uh, immune system from destroying it, right? It's basically doing what viruses do, right? It's it's shutting off a, a, a host immune response, but it happens to be doing it in a way that's that's beneficial for uh, placental development in mammals. Um, finally, some herbs can still invoke immune responses, which could serve to help protect against infections, right? Um, in many ways, viruses will repel other viruses that are trying to invade similar cells. Um, and so this kind of activation of the immune response can provide some kind of, um, can provide some autoimmunity. Um, however, the downside of this particular thing is that in individuals that have immune immunodeficiency, that are uh, immunodeficient, um, these retroviruses can become active and become viruses. They can, they can reinfect and actually cause um, lots of harm. And there's actually so several diseases such as AGS that is caused by these uh, reactivated endogenous retroviruses. So you you take you got to take the good with the bad when it comes to when it comes to these sorts of things. Okay, so in summary, let's wrap all of this up and review all of the things we've talked about concerning the parasites in your genome. So first, most of your genome, greater than 50%, is occupied by parasitic DNA. Um, these parasites cause a range of genetic diseases when they're mobilized, though luckily most of them are either degraded, defective, or have been silenced by our own genomes. Um, parasitic DNA come in a few major groups, the LTR retrotransposons, uh, which include things like retroviruses, um, non-LTR retrotransposons, which are like the alu elements, lines, and signs, and the DNA transposons. Um, parasitic DNA evolves mostly neutrally, back matching the background rate of mutation, um, and thus is a really useful molecular clock. 
Um, genome size positively correlates with the percent of parasitic DNA and negatively with the population size, meaning that they are evolving under effective neutrality despite being harmful. Right. That is to say that they're proliferating in genomes where the organisms have relatively smaller populations, and so selection is not as efficient in those populations. Finally, parasitic DNA and the host genome are under a molecular arms race, with silencing proteins needing to rapidly evolve to keep the parasite from being able to replicate. Um, and then, obviously, just before this, we talked a little bit about how uh, transposons can be co-opted and domesticated by the host genome to actually perform some beneficial uh, functions. Though we have to take the good with the bad because sometimes those same functions can actually be quite harmful. Um, so I know this was a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave me a comment um, if you have any questions about any of the stuff we've talked about so far. I would be happy to chat about this further. Um, parasitic DNA is something I'm, I'm super interested in. I'm super excited about. Um, and I would love to talk about it further. Thanks so much for being here, um, and I will see you next time.